how are du'as answered from the perspective of a cause and effect? Before that, we need to talk about what du'a is. My understanding of du'a is a little bit different to what people may have heard. And this is inspired by what Imam Ali says in Dua Kumail. Imam Ali in Dua Kumail says, اغفر لمن لا يملك إلا الدعاء. In other words, I think, well, my understanding of it is this, that insan has nothing other than dua. And even when I'm talking to you, you may understand me, you may not understand me. But by talking, I'm making a dua that God help that person understand me. Or when I go to work, it's not that my work leads to the rizq. I'm working through that work. I'm making a dua to God to give me rizq. And then it's interesting. Quran says, if you want rizq, وَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ الله. Go and get from the grace of God. But that doesn't mean sit down and say, God, I want it. Now, go to work. Going to work is a physical dua. In other words, insan's relationship with God is based on her or his needs. Each need that you have, when you make an effort to satisfy that need, that's a dua. Although sometimes dua is sitting down and asking God. Sometimes it's making a move and through that move asking God. So when you look at it this way, you realize that Everything is happening by God. We just make du'as for them to happen. Um, well, uh, that's my understanding. Um, yeah. Where can I buy the amazing hoodie from? This is the question of the day, I think. I think you'll get a better answer for that. <laughs> Subtain.store. That's S-I-B-T-A-Y-N dot store. You have multiple uh, options to choose from, different sizes. You can also, I think, uh, brothers are working on personalized hoodies as well. So do keep an eye out, inshallah. If, if God loves me, why does he warn us with hell? Oh, beautiful. Close the doors. We're not going to let you go till we settle this down. If God loves me, why does he warn me about hell? Um, there's a few areas of this that we need to talk about. First of all, a lot of our Mufassirin believe in this, what I want to say. There may be some who have a different opinion, but I think that goes against the view of ahl Bayt. There are many Mufassirin, such as Allah Taba Taba'i, currently Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, who say that hell is not God inflicting pain on us. Hell is only the person seeing the consequence of their own action. Right? Masalan it says, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَحْ Whoever does an atom's weight of bad will see that bad. It's not that another angel will come and hurt you. Let me give you an example so you understand. I'm not denying hella, I'm explaining what it is. I've spoken about this example a few times in my lectures. Imagine your dentist tells you, if you don't brush your teeth, your teeth will be, you'll get cavity and then you may lose your teeth. It may reach your nerves, it may be so painful. Oh, it's a warning, right? But if you don't brush your teeth, what would happen? Will the dentist Sneaking through, I don't know, your chimney, come into your room and give you cavity. No. Nah. Not brushing naturally leads to poor teeth hygiene and that leads to pain. Hala, God's warnings are the same. God is like your dentist. Then you, if you don't do this, you'll harm yourself. Or if you do this, you'll harm yourself. And why would your dentist tell you, by the way, this? Out of love, right? Does your dentist hate you? No, he's giving you information. Past warnings about hell is not that if you don't do this, I will send angels to hurt you. Warning about hell is God's love. And son, if you go there, life will become difficult. 
Let me give you one example. Masana, God in the Quran says, Ensign, if you lie, life will become hell. And that's something I've seen many times. People say that we made a few lies, we got used to it, we ruined the relationship. But in your own lies ended your relationship. Is that not hell? Past pain is involved, but God is not causing it. And the fact that God is telling us about it is actually out of his love. But another area in which one series I need to speak about how our ideology is different to ideology of Ahle Bayt. How many of you have heard after you die there's no hope? Honestly, please raise your hand that your chance of changing after die, after you die is over. Although you're shy, no one's going to raise their hand, but 80% of us have heard that. Last night, were you not reading the Abu Hamza Thumali? Imam says, God, even if I go to hell, my hope in you will never stop. Yani Imam Sajjad says, even after you die, you go to hell, there's still hope. Why? Because hell is God's hospital. In the same way that if I have a toothache, مثلا, even if it's reached my nerve, even if it's so painful, I go to surgery, they fix it for me, and then I go to heaven. And that's why you see Asan, Abu Hamza Thumali, one of the first lines is, Elahi la tu'addibni bi'uqubatik. God, your uqubah, that consequence, a lot of people call it punishment, hell, whatever, is for ta'adib, for the person to learn something so that then they can go to heaven. Ke Imam Sajjad says, God, Asan, I don't want to learn through ta'adib, through uqubah. In other words, God, I don't want to learn that I should brush through not brushing, seeing my teeth hurt, and then waking up. Does that make sense? Pass. First of all, God is not inflicting the pain. It's just a result of our own actions. And God is telling us about that because he loves us. In other words, anything God says don't do will some form or shape harm us. Allah, um, I hope that explains it. I want to strengthen my belief in Allah. My belief increases and decreases. I'm, I'm guessing some sort of fluctuation in their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Depends on the day. And sometimes I don't believe. What, what can you advise me? Um, I would say two things. Um, one thing would be we all need to really um, re-evaluate our understanding of God. It's not our fault, but the God most of us were told was not interesting. Oh, um, I don't know if last night when you were reading Joshan Kabir, you had the energy to pay attention or not. Some of the lines in Dua Joshan Kabir, honestly, many of us, if we say it, it's a lie. Imam says, God, you're the most beautiful. You're the most kind. You're the most forgiving. You're this. You did that for me. And I'm like, for many of us, is that really who God is for us? Nah. God's the one who's going to do this for me. God's the one who ordered me to do so many things I don't understand. And if I miss one, he's going to punish me. But one thing we really need to do is to relearn who God is and what's the best place to do that? All oh, these du'as. Wallah, now that the a'mal are gone, go back to Joshan Kabir. Listen, and every night read one line of it. See, what are you reading about God? It's so beautiful. God of ahl Bayt is so different to our God. Hope. So that's one thing. God should be so beautiful that naturally you're drawn to him. And... I always tell people, who is the person that you don't need to work to remember them? As when someone says, Sheikh, how can I remember God in my day? I tell them, who are the people you naturally remember? Say, oh, my child, I love my child so much. I'm like, there you go. If you want to remember God, you have to love him. How can I love God? You have to know how beautiful he is. Naturally, you fall in love. So that was option number one. We need to relearn about God. Asan, as easy as that. Go read Joshan Kabir for yourself, English. Second thing, then you need to find this beautiful God in your own life. 
امام حسین این دو عرفه has a workshop of how can I find God in my life. It's so beautiful. But this one, can, we've even written a book on it. If you want, you can go and read it. Imam Hussein takes your hand and says, let me show you God in your own life. Look at your childhood. This is where God was. Look at this. And then Imam even mentions five ways God communicates directly with people. When you learn a little bit about this, you find God in your own life. And Quran says, when you find God in your own life, there's no going away. You can never forget him. So these are two advices that I would have. Hassan Tumbarakalafikum. Practical tips on how to cleanse the mind. Maybe I think uh, this question is probably referring to maybe memories of some sorts. Continues to say to forget indecency, etc. Um, very good question. How to cleanse our mind of whatever it could be memories, it could be indecent things, etc. Let me give you something that would really help you, and um, you wouldn't get this, by the way, everywhere. Insan has different levels, right? There's the level of your actions, levels of your qualities. And then there's a deeper level, that's the level of what your soul really believes about the world. And each level, if you want to create change, you can't create a change by a level higher. Yani, if you want to, for example, change what's in your mind through a level higher, that's masala, actions, that is very difficult. The best way is to go to a level deeper, create a change there. Naturally, all the levels at top would be better. Masalan, let's say I'm jealous. Through my actions, I can't really change that jealousy. I need to go a level deeper than jealousy. Why do I even get jealous? What beliefs do I have about the world? How am I seeing the world? How am I relating to God and the world that makes me jealous? Oh, I'm saying the strongest way, the best way to correct the mind by not fighting the mind. Because you can't convince your mind through itself. Even in meditation, they say, the meditation, they say, has three levels. In the first level, you try to fight the negative thoughts. Those who go a little bit deeper, they say you can't fight negative thoughts. The more you fight them, the stronger they become. Just observe them. Those who go a little bit deeper, they say even observing them is not that easy. Sometimes they're very sticky. It's like have, you must have heard that thing that like think of your thoughts as the clouds in the sky. Just let them pass. But there's two problems with that. First of all, some thoughts are so sticky they don't pass. And secondly, sometimes even as they pass, they create so much pain for us. So even in meditation, they say the best thing you can do is to connect to a part of yourself deeper than the thoughts that will give you so much peace that even if a thought comes, it wouldn't annoy you. And I'm telling you that if you go deep enough, your soul will find so much peace that naturally those thoughts will slowly, slowly not even come. What's that deepest place inside you? It's your relationship with God. If you manage in your own heart, in a very real way, connect to God, then your soul finds such peace that all the levels at the top will slowly, slowly get cleansed. And that's why, Mr. some really, those, you know, experienced spiritual teachers say the solution to almost all ethical issues is fixing that relationship with God. And well, what that means, it doesn't mean go do salata. That's the problem we have. It doesn't mean go read more Quran. No, that wouldn't give you a relationship with God, at least initially for most people who don't know. Do your wajibat to ina. But for now, think of your relationship with God as something else. It's a relationship in your heart. Later on, inshallah, you'll learn how to do that in salat. But when I'm telling you relationship with God, I'm not telling you go and do more a'mal. Now, build that relationship and if you want more information about that, on the book on the Abu Hamza Thumali, through the teachings of Imam Sanjad, we've opened that up a little bit. So maybe you could refer there. 
What is the Islamic perspective on unintentional exposure to sinful behavior or content, and how can one protect and nurture their soul while living in a such a noisy world that may contain such influences? Yeah, which was well, the topic we said, Hassan, in this culture, it's impossible not to be exposed to indecency. Uh, so one of the motivation behind a couple of nights of the lectures was to address this issue. And you were alone in a culture in which the methodology many families had is not going to work. So Islamically, if something is not, uh, what is it called, voluntarily, then there's no issue there. Oh, and it's not like God will say, why did you commit a sin? Oh, I, it wasn't my fault, I didn't, it was there. But hello, forget about do's and don'ts of religion for a while. Spiritually, psychologically, just for myself, I don't want to be impacted. What can I do? That's the get when I said we need to, inshallah, raise a little bit spiritually. Um, that's why I say, Alan, it's a time in which it's not about, oh, if I look, this will happen to me. You're going to look, the thought is going to come to your mind. All of us, were going to go through this. So it's time we get our soul to such place that these things wouldn't impact us. I told you, the our Ahle Bayt tell us, Mutaqi can reach a place in which whatever they see in the world of God, it only reminds them of God. I mean, let me give you an example. Uh, this is, by the way, in that Abu Hamza Thamali book, I've opened it up, but just to give you a, um, a taste of it. Imam Sajjad says, most people who come to this world, it's like someone going to a gallery without knowing the artist. They look at the paintings and they become mesmerized. Oh, look at this painting. Ooh, look at this. And then they may get stuck in one painting. Ooh, if only I could take this painting home or if that. Imam Sajjad says, Muvahid is like the person who enters into the gallery with the artist. So at every painting, the only thing that happens, their appreciation for the artist increases. The artist shows them this painting, like, oh wow, what did you create? And then the artist shows them, they're not, oh wow. Imam says, Muvahid lives in this world like this. If they see anything beautiful, they don't get stuck there. They immediately say, Alhamdulillah, what a beautiful creator. And slowly, slowly, they get to know the artist so much, which is God. God starts showing them other special things he has. Like what Imam Kazim said. Imam Kazim says this gallery of this dunya is not the VIP section. That artist has created so much more. Then he shows you the spiritual beauties. And then by that point, Imam Sajjad just says, give whatever beauty you see in this world, say, okay, it's nice, but I've seen more. So now that's a gist of, I know by the way, this may seem a little bit far-fetched, but this could be your reality in a very short time. And I think everyone needs to get there and easily can. You just need the right understanding. Um, that's, that's inshallah where we need to get. And it's not just, by the way, with indecency, okay, masalan, I see something that pulls me toward it, with everything. Masalan, Imam Ali has a hadith. He says, for a person who hasn't reached that level of tawheed, they see what their friends have or another person has, they get jealous. But the muwahid reaches a place, whatever they see makes them happy. Oh, look what my creator has made. That relationship with God is so important. And if these feels vague, well, inshallah, later on we can open it up. At least get the headline, uh, then later on maybe we can talk about it. Inshallah. This is a question, I uh, believe, from a lady. For us women, we don't pray for a week per month. So I'm, it's the uh, monthly cycle. Nor can read Quran, so how can I have a long-term relationship with God and Quran when the resources for it are limited for some times per month? I'm glad you asked because it's interesting. One thing I've realized is that when I say a sentence, not everything I wanted has come across. So it's nice to throw different questions, talk about the same thing. 
God care is not necessary in the Quran. Any Quran is teaching you how to find God in your own life. And so, maybe Prophet Ibrahim in the Quran says what? When he wants to describe God. Imagine the role model of Tawheed in the Quran. Prophet Ibrahim is so high. He says, God, or another prophet says. And even according to some of our prophets, God was who? The one who fed them. The one who gave them water. And if God is that real, Masalan Bibi Prophet Ibrahim, every time he drank water and it was nice, he got that pleasure directly from God. Right now in our life, we're interacting with God on a daily basis. We just don't see his hand. An example that may help is this. Imagine you're seeing a calligraphy being written. You can either look at the pen, be like, yes, the pen is writing calligraphy. Or you can say, no, it's the hand. Without the hand, the pen wouldn't write calligraphy. Or you can say, no, John, it's the artist. The artist is writing calligraphy. Oh, look, Quran says this, in your life, someone hugs you. Someone shows you kindness. You can either think this person showed me kindness, or you can say, no, God through this person showed me kindness. Pass, according to Quran, according to Ahl Bayt, that's the best way of connecting to God in your life. Anything good that happens, no, God sent it to you. That's number one. Number two, anytime you feel weak, Masalan, you're taking care of a child, you're taking care of someone, your energy runs out. That's another opportunity to talk to God. God, give me more energy. Believe me, it's as simple as that. And God will give you. A few times you see that, okay, eh, I got weak, I got scared, I got tired, and I asked God and He gave me energy. Then the Asan, you realize, oh my God, I can, I can relate to God in any situation. In any moment. Follow-up question? Nah, something bad happens, subhanallah. I mean, we have two journeys. Alhamdulillah and subhanallah. And in the book, I've opened this up. Alhamdulillah means anything good that happens, I need to connect it to God. Subhanallah means anything bad happens, I shouldn't connect it to God. We do the opposite. If you look at it, we're like this. Anything bad happens, like, God, why did you do that? Anything good happens, and we don't remember God. Quran says, if you look at it correctly, one day you'll see yourself, and we can explain why bad can't go to God. It's not like an arbitrary thing. We can talk about it, and in the book I've opened it up. But one day you'll see, till then, subhanallah means insan. Anytime anything bad happened to you, no, wallah, I wouldn't hurt you. There's something going on. Either you will see it's gonna turn out for your own benefit, or you will see that someone wanted to hurt you. It wasn't me, I'll make it up for you. Like when brothers of Yusuf throw him in the well, God said, oh, I didn't want that to happen to you, don't write that for me. And you're like, oh, why did you allow it to happen, God? God says, don't worry, I'll make this work for you. Quran many times says what? Wal aqibatu lil muttaqin. Mutaqi is who? The one who lives with God. God says, if you live with God, the end result will always be for you. Even if at that moment you feel like you've been hurt, something wrong is happening, if you make that relationship with God, God says, I'll make it work for you. Someone comes, hurts you, says, God says, I will make that in your favor. Well, has good things in our life. Thank you, God, for sending it. Bad things, subhanAllah. My God would never hurt me. He's promised. One day I'll know why this happens. God, I'll trust in you. These two things you do for a few months and then see if you can ever forget God. And I challenge you to forget God after that. What is the duty of the youth towards the Imam of our time? Guys, this is a serious answer, by the way, y'all. And you don't think this is just something I'm telling you, you know, because someone asked the question. I think our duty towards the 12th Imam is to spend so much time understanding the earlier Imams. 
ببین این اوردر تو آندرستان مور اباوت دی ویژن اف دی 12 چپتر یو نید تو هاف ا ویری گود آندرستاندینگ اف دی ارلیر چپترز وی هاف هاد 11 چپترز اف امامز a chapter of prophet a chapter of lady fatima خب two extra chapters there as well if you want to know how can you be beneficial for the 12th one you need to really get a good grasp of the early one and to be honest with you when i look at us i don't think we know the ahle bayt maybe knowing the ahle bayt is not مثلا these posters we make those are good ah ke مثلا this was the name of his mother this was the year of his born all of that is good Knowing them is knowing how do they think. What is their understanding of insan? And I'm not blaming us. I mean, there were companions next to the Ahle Bayt who didn't know them. In the battle, this is so fundamental. Uh, this goes back to us and what is special about Ahle Bayt. Believe me, we don't know. And not that we don't know. The answer is there. Allah, majority don't know. Let me give you one simple example. Battle of Sifi. When Muawiyah has access to water, what does he do? He doesn't allow the, uh, the group of Imam Ali have water. When Imam Ali's group gets water, do you know what the people do? They retaliate. They want to now block the water to act to people of Muawiyah. Imam Ali says, no, 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 no. That's not our style. I have an understanding of insan and what is the correct way that even for people of Muawiyah, we don't block them of water. Do you know what this shows? There were people next to Imam Ali who thought like Muawiyah. The same happened with Prophet. When Prophet and the Muslims went back to Mecca, they were really harmed by people in Mecca. They were kicked out of their houses. Many of them were killed, tortured. So when people went back to Mecca, a lot of people were saying, Al yawm yawmul malhamah. Malhamah comes from lahm. Means we're going to cut people, torture people. Not, not torture, I, I take that back. Kill people, basically. You know what Prophet said? Al yawm yawmul marhamah. Today is the day of mercy. Prophet forgave everyone. You see, past the majority of Muslims had a different view of what needs to be done to the Prophet. And someone said, nah, Abu Sufyan has done so much harm. Prophet said, anyone who goes to the house of Abu Sufyan is like the one who's gone to Kaaba is safe. This vision that Prophet had, many Muslims didn't have. Imam Ali had in Sefi. Imam Hassan had. Imam Hussein had, all of the Ahle Bayt have, we don't have. And we are still like the ones who always got it wrong. I can give you so many stories of companions rushing to do something, the Prophet or Imam say, no, 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 come back, come back. My son, the person comes and swears at the Prophet, companions go, let's go destroy the guy. Imam says, Baba, she's the Prophet says, Oh, no, it's so interesting. Ahl Bayt knew Prophet. My son, there's a person who hurts the Prophet, says something to Prophet. The Prophet tells Imam Ali, cut his tongue. Companions thought Imam Ali is going to go cut his tongue. You know what Imam Ali did? He went out, gave the guy so much money. He said, are you happy now? No, more money. Happy now? No, more money. Are you happy now? He said, yes. You wouldn't go spread things against us? He said, oh, go. Because his tongue was give him as much as he needs till he calms down. That's what Imam Ali did. Give him as much as he needs till he calms down. A lot of people thought Imam Ali is going to go cut his tongue. Hello, go to Dua Makar Mul Akhlaq. Maybe a lot of people مثلا, think Imam Zaman is going to come get revenge. Go and read Dua Makar Mul Akhlaq and see what is Imam Sajjad's view of revenge. As then he asked God, God help me to get revenge on those who hurt me through doing good to them. To repay those who cut from me by connecting to them. Honestly, read this. This is the second page of Makarim al-Akhlaq. And then you see, oh my God, we still don't know the ahl Bayt. If you get to know them, then naturally Imam Zaman himself will 
I'm not going to continue that sentence. Um, what is the spiritual dimension of marriage? Um, for a lot of my wife and I, the guiding sentence for us was that line between Imam Ali and Lady Fatima, salam alayha, okay, describing one another. They said, Ni'mal Aoun ala ta'atillah. They said, my partner is a, is a help for me in this journey towards God. And we also have that verse in which God says that marriage is a place in which uh, two very important qualities can be found. What is that? The taskunu and what is that? So three qualities actually. Mawadda, Rahma, and Sukun, Taskeen. So God says if two souls, it's not like that's true of any marriage, by the way, or that marriage is the only way. Someone may not be able to get married. God will always, let me tell you, God will never remain in anyone's debt, by the way. If someone, for whatever reason, couldn't get married, don't think that God didn't give you part of your share. God will find a way. God will not. God hasn't brought any soul to this world with a, incomplete resources. But a very good resource is marriage in which two people within them, they create a space that's bigger than both of them. And in that space, mercy, peace, and a kind of groundedness happens that neither of them individually have. Yani, God says when two people with good intentions, pure intentions, with a lot of love come, something is created within them that neither of them have. And all of those couples who live spiritually have felt this. Masalan, they say, when we talk to each other, just the act of talking creates a space in which we find our answers or creates a space in which we find the peace in a difficult situation. So, so for me, marriage is an amazing house for a soul in this world. Because increasingly as you age, you realize this world is like an ocean. Your soul is always swimming. There are very few places you get rest. Even when you sleep, a lot of the times you see dreams that makes your mind active. These places in which your soul can just rest a little bit to go back to pressures of life, one of the very beautiful one is a marriage, if it's done right. Another one was these sessions. That's why every night I told people, this is heaven that we come here to a session like that. Read Abu Hamza together. Your soul gets to breathe a little bit before it goes back to swimming. So I think marriage is that, but we need to have sessions on how to get this marriage spiritually because a lot of people are married but they still don't know that I mean, marriage according to Islam is the coming together of two souls primarily. The bodies come together on, but the main thing is the souls. I feel like many of us were still married at body level. We need to inshallah talk about according to Ahl Bayt, how can you find the soul of your partner and then you see that it's such a different journey.